Joshua with Perspective Approach, we're actually starting to partner with him for our Leadership Solutions Program. That's going to be an additional service that we offer, and it's going to be awesome. So we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, but just wanted to give you a heads up so you kind of knew what's going on. So I am going to make sure everyone's muted, and then I am going to turn it over to Joshua. So like I said, Joshua is with Perspective Approach. He's an awesome, awesome leadership trainer. He does like consultations. He um, is a coach. He's awesome. So I'm going to turn it over to him and let him start. And then, like I said, at the end, we will do questions and then talk about the services that Josh offers. So Joshua, go ahead and take it away. Okay. Well, thank you, Heather. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I appreciate you uh, being here. I want to spend the next about 45 minutes uh, discussing teamwork, a little bit about leadership, which kind of undergirds everything I'll discuss today. Um, and then the big question that almost every company I work with, almost every leader who I train asks is, how do I motivate my employees? How do I get them to show up with their A game every day or even like their B minus game? So uh, that's what we're gonna cover today. Uh, trust, teamwork, leadership. We're gonna talk a little bit about conflict uh, management, the inevitable uh, result of working with other human beings. And then finally, how, how do we motivate another human being uh, to do their very best work all the time. I don't know how much of my background you're aware of based on what was put out for this, but I'm a retired Marine Gunnery Sergeant. I've uh, personally trained and led tens of thousands of high-performing teams and dynamic operations all around the globe, which is why you'll see and hear a fair amount from uh, the military. There's nothing gory, um, no, no PTSD type moments, anything like that that's going to happen today, but I will be referencing uh, military tactics or techniques and a few stories a fair amount today. So if that's off-putting to you, I'm sorry. Show a little grace and, and wisdom uh, to me. That's how I prefer to communicate. So let's see if I can jump right in. So most of the information that uh, I'll be presenting today comes from two sources. One of them is from this man, this author, Patrick Lencioni. He's written many books, but two of them are The Five Dysfunctions of a Team and The Ideal Team Player. So some of the data that you see, some of the techniques that you see are drawn out of those two books. And then just about everything else comes from my experience um, as a leadership trainer and well as well as my time in the Marine Corps. So this picture right here is, is kind of fun and cool. They're not sliding down the rope. That helicopter is actually flying at about 80 to 120 miles per hour with anywhere from four to eight Marines dangling from the end of the rope. And the reason I have that picture up is because that is day number two of their training. It is also the second day that they've ever worked with each other. They've, they've not met except for the day prior to that photo being taken. So when I talk about having led teams and dynamic operations, please don't make the assumption that folks in the military have just worked together and the military is its own thing. Of course, in some, some regard, yes. But uh, the reality is you can form strong bonds with good leadership, good morale and collaboration and get really, really excellent results in just a few days if you, if you do, do it the right way. So. I'm gonna do one of the worst things that you can do and throw some statistics at you right off the bat. So I can't see any of you right now, I'm just seeing my screen. But if I were in front of you, I'd certainly ask you to raise your hand. If you are a nerd or a data collector, the next three minutes are for you. I've got some stories that come up after that. But teamwork stats. About three out of four employers rate teamwork as very important. Not just marginally or even important, but very important, the highest rating that they could give. Almost nine out of 10 employees and executives say that a failure in teamwork and a failure of communication is the primary uh, cause of almost every workplace failure. And it's a little bit anecdotal, but think on that for yourself. How many times when something goes wrong do we say it was a miscommunication? And oftentimes it's because of a complete lack of communication. About four out of 10 non-managerial, non-supervisory type employees, just the Joe Schmo workers, believe that their leaders, from frontline supervisor all the way up through the executive team, do not collaborate enough with themselves or with other leaders, with other leaders in the company. 
This is one of my favorites, and I'm going to give this statistic to you in reverse in a moment. 99.1% of people say, if there's an issue, address it, right? Because whether you've heard this saying or not, if you don't uh, condemn it, you condone it. If you don't condemn it, you condone it. We don't want things to fester, right? So let me give you the reverse of that statement. Only 0.9% of people at a company want you to beat around the bush. That doesn't mean we can be tactless. We need to be courteous, professional, respectful, but less than 1% of people would prefer you not address the issue quickly, openly, candidly uh, when something adverse happens. About half of collaboration improvement has nothing to do with work. It's literally just us being human beings together, social creatures who do have emotions. Those don't just get checked at the door. Worldviews, religions, all these things are part of humanity. Half of collaborative improvements happen because we've formed a bond with another human being. And then finally, the last statistic I'll give you on uh, the issue of teamwork, or the topic of teamwork, is that within Fortune 500 companies, typically the top 15% of high-performing teams, the leaders of those teams spend potentially up to 21% of a work week collaborating with their peers, their peers. And this is a concept that I'll, I'll talk about more in depth at a later time and a little bit later in this presentation. But of course, a leader should be constantly engaged with, um, with their team who they lead. But their primary team is actually folks who they might not work with very often, typically. Uh, it's that if you were to draw a horizontal line on your org chart, whoever that line touches, that's your peer. Even if they're in a completely unrelated department or division, somebody who you rarely uh, have any interaction with, the highest performing team leaders interact with those people. 20% of the time, that's on the high end there, if we just simply do the math on that, if we work five days a week, 20% of the time is the equivalent of spending one whole day a week collaborating with their peers. Obviously not all at once, but that's the equivalent. That means something when we talk about teamwork. You probably have some questions because this is not a normative concept. This is almost a fringe concept, but the people who get it, as you see, the top 15% get it and it works. I do have one caveat, one warning for you. Meetings do not equal collaboration. Um, they can, of course, but we've all been in meetings where there's some tyrannical dictator who hogs the stage for 45 minutes or somebody who's just super in touch with his or her emotions and takes 30 minutes to bring up personal drama from their household that really has no bearing in this context. And that's not collaboration in and of itself, that a meeting does not equal collaboration. So please don't hear me say, you need to have more meetings. Most of the time I actually advocate for the opposite of that when I work with the company. So my question to you, how often do your people, especially your leaders at any level, frontline supervisors up through the executive team, how often do they actually collaborate? If we're honest with ourselves, a lot of times it, it may not be as much as it needs to be. Um, and of course there are techniques to improve communication and planning and you know putting agendas out and and so forth but one of the the multifaceted uh, important areas of effective teamwork is the ability to collaborate to draw ideas out from one another what are the best practices what are the lessons learned from this last operation or event that we executed a week ago a month ago five years ago what lessons can we draw from that so how often are we collaborating with our teams I'm gonna give you a quick story. Um, I'm, I'm gonna cut it a little bit short in the interest of time, but years and years ago, uh, 2003, I had just come back from my first combat deployment in Iraq. And right away we start training again to get ready because six months later you go to war again. So uh, one of the first training evolutions that we had was the gas chamber. I don't probably need to go into detail uh, for many of you, it's, it's a miserable event. We wear these big heavy suits. It's 120 degrees in this place called 29 Palms, California. It's just miserable, awful. And of course you wear a mask that restricts 70% of your air intake. So it's like you only have a third of a lung to breathe with. And through events that really were out of my control, I ended up being in this room all by myself with my mask thrown outside, doing push-ups, and essentially 
watching my insides turn into my outsides. And I'm sorry if you're eating, I realize it's 12 o'clock, so I won't get any more graphic than that. But two words popped into my head. Um, two words that my college professor actually drilled into me. Anagnorisis and peripatia. Anagnorisis and peripatia. These are not words that we typically hear in our modern day uh, English language. They're not brought up in conversation, but I'd like to take just a moment to explain them to you and then say why these are so important for leaders uh, and for those who, who are supervising other people. Anagnorisis is essentially the aha moment in a story. Both of these words come from classical Greek literature. So if you ever you know, read the Odyssey or the Iliad or something like that, these words are pretty prevalent. Anagnorisis is the aha moment. And so to give you a, a somewhat modern day equivalent of an anagnorisis moment, uh, when Darth Vader, spoiler alert, when Darth Vader reveals to Luke Skywalker that he's his father, well, that's, that's an anagnorisis moment. It's a big event. It is not the climax of the story, but it's a big event that, wow, that's an impactful realization. By the way, the original Star Wars movie, the first one that came out, uh, is over 40 years old now. So if you were in the theater and that came out, you are officially old, but that's a good thing. Uh, peripatia, peripatia is the turning point in how we look at ourselves or a character in a story. Again, not the climax of the story, but a turning point. So if you're a fan of like M. Night Shyamalan movies or um, Guy Ritchie films, it's when they kind of pull the rug right from out from underneath you. And now you look at the entire story with new eyes, not just changing a perspective a little bit, but everything has a completely different meaning. Now, a good example of that would be in the sixth sense. It's an older movie as well. Hopefully you've seen it. So spoiler alert, but Bruce Willis at the very end of the movie finds out he's a ghost. And so now we, we very quickly in just a matter of moments replay the whole movie in our head and everything means something different now. Interactions, conversations hold an entirely different weight. Now, the reason I took that much time explaining these two uh, very unique, non-common words is because I believe that the leaders who are capable of identifying anagnorisis and peripatia moments are the most effective leaders, assuming that they are willing to take action on those realizations. And so as we go through this presentation, consider the anagnorsis or peripatia moments. Look through conversations you've had the past week, the past month with your employees, with your peers, with your boss, and, and see things from a different perspective. And we'll jump into that shortly. Uh, very quickly, uh, I'm not really talking about leadership, but leadership undergirds everything I'm talking about. Out of 10 senior managers, how many would you say have no passion, no passion, zero, for their work? By the way, this is self-reported, so this is not some jaded senior manager above them uh, who's, who's upset. It, it, surely it's, it's got to be one, right? No more than one or three. There's no way. Oh, dear. Eight. Eight out of ten senior managers self-report that they have no passion for their work. They may care about the people but they don't care about the job itself anymore. And most often the reason they say that is because it's, I'm not doing the job I was hired for. I'm no longer, you know, on an assembly line, just to give a very simple example, I'm no longer on an assembly line building cabinet doors or product X. Now I'm supervising people and now I'm a senior manager. So I'm doing even more of that. And they've lost their passion for their work. What that really shows us is that they fail to recognize their real duty as a leader is to encourage everyone else underneath them to do their job as best as they possibly can, to train and equip them so that their team and their company ultimately flourishes. By the way, about half of all quits are because of the immediate supervisor. That could be a frontline, you know, bottom of bottom rung leader or the owner of the company but whoever that direct or immediate supervisor is, is why about half of people quit somewhat unexpectedly. Vilfredo Pareto. If you have never heard of the Pareto principle, 
I would encourage you to just do a quick study on it, but I'll give you the, the Cliff's Notes versions, uh, version. Goffredo Pareto essentially uh, was an economist, theologian, and philosopher. And he found out that roughly 20% of uh, the nation owned 80% of the wealth. And so he was intrigued by that and he started studying it with math, with science, with econ you know, economics, uh, in, in all these areas of life that we study and put the term ology on the end. And it actually holds up that it's a little bit anecdotal. It's obviously an estimate, but about 80% of all results are results from 20% input. And we see this, if you volunteer at church, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. If you look at your organization with really honest, open, candid eyes, about 20% of the people do 80% of the work. Everyone else is, you know, not lackadaisical, not apathetic, but they're just kind of chugging along. They're not really going above and beyond. So to kind of prove this to you, just last year, Gallup, we all heard of Gallup, found that 77% of a team's performance, of variance within team's performance, is directly attributed to the leader. Let that sink in. If you're not a numbers and statistics guy or gal, I, please hear this one. We like to talk about the importance of people. And if you were to work with me, you'd know I have a heart for people. My message is love your people. And I take it to the extreme. 77% of a team's performance, however, has very little to do with who's on the team. It is the leader of that team that drives the results, holds the standard, trains the team, sets the bar, improves the morale. It's the leader. It is the leader that is the linchpin in all of this. That's not to say that people don't matter. Don't hear me say that. But who the leader of that team is, is what will drive the team to success or failure. So if the leader sets the tone that strongly, if it's that important that we have the right person in the right job at the right time, or that we train and develop that leader, what do your leaders care about? Real faces, real names. Who are your leaders and what are they pushing every day to your company? How are they helping or hindering teamwork? How are they helping or hindering training? How are they helping or hindering the standard? Because there is no neutrality. They are either reinforcing a good behavior or a bad behavior. Even if it's through apathy, they're reinforcing one or the other. Again, if you don't condone it, you can or condemn it, you condone it. So what do your leaders care about? Now we're going to move into the five dysfunctions of a team. This is uh, from that first book that I put up near the beginning. Uh, these are the five absence of trust, fear of conflict, lack of commitment, avoidance of accountability, and inattention to as, uh, results. These are the five major downfalls to the success of a team, why teams seem to fail. Off to the right here, I'm throwing up a bunch of words for you a little quickly. Uh, here's what leads to those building blocks. A desire to be invulnerable leads to an absence of trust. An artificial harmony leads to a fear of conflict and so forth. So let's talk about trust just fairly briefly and invulnerability. So one of the reasons that we have this lack of trust in any organization, any team, is because of this desire to be invulnerable. And this can come from anyone, but I'll, you know, let's talk about mine. Right? Look at yourself. It could be because I'm arrogant. I legitimately think I am better than you. Maybe not as a person, but I am better trained and I'm just better. Well, because of that, I want to keep this veneer of perfection up so that you wouldn't doubt me. Maybe it's pride, which is different than arrogance. I don't believe I'm better than you, but maybe I believe I'm better than I am. And for the same reason, I, I strive to not put myself out there or be vulnerable. The flip side to these two things are the weakness and the fear. Maybe there is a technical competency that I lack. There's eight bullets in my job description and I can do seven of them really well, but number eight, I can't. I've never been trained or I'm scared to do it. I'm not talented at it. And so because of that, I seek to be invulnerable. I seek to put up a front either through apathy. Hey, look, go talk to HR about anything personal. I don't want anything to do. This is a work environment, so let's keep it professional. That's a weakness. Or maybe it's fear. I have a fear of 
you know, personal fears of being found out at something. Um, I'm not as good as I've purported to be. I uh, lack a certain skill set. Maybe I just have a fear of people on a really emotional kind of need some counseling level. I really struggle to be a people pleaser. And so because of that, I don't want to upset anybody. I don't want to rock the boat. So I'll just kind of keep my distance, not let you see me as a person. I'm just a coworker. So in vulnerability, one of the major contributing factors. The second is the company itself, the culture. And we're going to talk about culture near the end of the presentation, but how are people promoted in your company? How are they promoted? Is it truly by talent? If so, is it by talent exclusively? You know, technical competencies? Do we factor in that leaders are 80% of the time working with humans, not processes alone? Um, what are the office politics? Are there any? Chances are yes, even if they're good, but what are the politics? So maybe I, I wanna insulate myself from politics. And so I don't trust people on my team because I know that this person is a gossip and this person has the ear of the CEO, even though they shouldn't, this person, et cetera. And finally, history. Maybe I have just personal beef to use the term. I, I've had conflict, it's unresolved, or every time we communicate, it seems to go sideways with this person. And so I just, I'm gonna insulate myself from them and, and try to become invulnerable. So those are some of the contributing factors to a lack of trust on a team. Why would we want to be invulnerable? I just gave you a bunch of reasons, but ask the question sincerely. If we had trust, why would we want to be invulnerable? They kind of go in this circle, right? It's a leader's job to trust their people. You've heard all the time, respect is earned, trust is earned. It's actually quite the opposite. Yes, people can violate your trust. Yes, there are certain things that you do have to earn trust in, so to speak. But trust and respect should always be freely given until it's been violated and then the penalties come in. But why would we seek to be invulnerable? Ask that question to your leaders. Why would you seek this insulation from humanity? Uh, why do we avoid conflict, etc.? Okay, so I want to give you a really practical exercise. This is not something that we're actually going to do right now, but I want to walk you through the steps so that uh, when we're done with this presentation, this is something you could do you know, today, tomorrow, next week, next month. It's pretty, pretty simple. It's pretty easy, but it's very impactful. It's very impactful. Uh, shift the room. And what I mean by that is you're going to divide your team into peer groups. So again, we are, we are going to actively extract the leader from their normal team who they supervise and place them in a peer group. And that is their primary team now. That is what we would call their first team. Uh, if you read the five dysfunctions of a team, they talk about this in great detail. It's a very helpful book. It's like 14 bucks on Amazon. Go buy it. It's, it's worth your time. You can read the whole thing in about four hours. Your peer group, put them all together not organized by departments, but by, again, that horizontal line on an org chart. And what we're going to do is just two things. Uh, most of the time, it's a group of two to six people. Even very large organizations don't typically have more than six peers. But we're going to identify the greatest strength or contribution of one person in that peer group. And so all of us are going to say, here's, here's where you excel. Here is the value add to this team that you bring. And we can talk about it for 20, 30 seconds, but it's, it's pretty quick. Here's your value. And so that person who's being evaluated is just writing these down, not really saying much. Hey, thanks. I'm glad you think I'm, I add value there. Now, obviously, if I don't know the person or I don't see the value add, that's a problem. And that needs to be addressed right away. But we take the time to do that. And then here's more of the meat and potatoes of it. Identify the behavior that must be improved or removed. Okay, look, Joseph, you are a great rock star at this, but here is something that you really have to focus on improving. You've got to work on this. And you know, here's some tools, resources that I would recommend, but hey, here it is. And then the next person goes, the next person, the next person. So now we've all said, hey, Joseph, here's your greatest strength. Here's your weakest behavior that needs to be fixed or start doing this. And then we can discuss it. And then we move on to the next person. So depending on how big the team is and how in depth we want to go and how well we know each other, and how willing we are to engage in healthy conflict at times. Uh, this usually takes about 30 minutes. 30 minutes, you can, you can make it go an hour easily, but it's usually about a 30 minute exercise. So that's something that I would encourage you to do. 
It's a great way to begin a new team. Okay, so we're talking about this peer team that we will be creating. Uh, collaborative efforts. It's a great icebreaker, so to speak, but it's also impactful because it's, it's real talk. I'm basically saying, here's where you're great and here's where you stink. Fix it and I'll help you. I care enough to help you. And I don't have all the answers. I'm not perfect because in five minutes, you're going to lay into me with my weaknesses too. So it's a great way to be candid uh, with one another. Continuing on with teamwork. Teamwork is not inherent. Teamwork is an unnatural concept to humans. It, it does not come instinctively. It is unnatural to function as a member of a team. I have a one month old living in my house right now. I have a new baby. He is not a team player at all. My wife and I are exhausted. And so if you can see my face and you're seeing the bags under my eyes, forgive me, give me some grace here, but we're so tired. <laughs> Pray for us. Teamwork is not inherent. We're selfish individuals by nature. However, Teamwork is intuitive. It's essentially, we can immediately apprehend the benefit of working as a member of a team, of joining forces with somebody else. In addition to my one month old, the other reason I'm tired is I have a one year old. And so my one year old, he's almost two now, but technically still one, he understands the value of teamwork. And so he recruits his older sister to push the chair over so he can climb up and get those chewy gummy Flintstone vitamins uh, he recognizes the value and I can't do everything on my own. So teamwork, when we understand that it's, it's not natural, that's why we struggle with it, but we understand that it's, it's beneficial. When we can marry those two things together is, is kind of the framework for why we need teamwork, how we should push this uh, to our people. Look, I, know, I understand this doesn't come naturally to you, but you should be able, especially as an adult, to see the benefit of working as a team. Unfortunately, some people still don't, and that's why the leader is so critical. Oh, my, pix my picture's a little pixelated here. I'm sorry for that, but uh, the strength of the pack is the wolf. The strength of the wolf is a pack, the pack. This comes from uh, Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book. This is also the motto of my first unit in the Marine Corps, 3rd Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion. You're very smart individuals but I am gonna take about two minutes to unpack this for you. The strength of the pack is the wolf. Effective organizations understand that you are only as strong as your weakest link. In the military, if I have a squad of 12 Marines and 11 of them can run a six minute mile in full gear and one of them can run a seven minute mile, what's the effective maximum speed that we can go? Seven, seven minute miles not six, even if everyone else can do it. We're only as strong as our weakest link. So organizations who recognize that seek to pour themselves out into the individual members of the team. Again, you'll hear me talk about the importance of leaders, but obviously what's the leader's job? To, to give themselves away in service to the people on their team, to train them, to mentor them. That does mean personal topics. Of course, it means professional. So we invest in our people. The second part, the strength of the wolf is the pack. Just like my son recruiting his older sister, we understand that no matter how many certifications there are or how many PhDs you've attached to the end of your name, you cannot do everything yourself, especially if we're part of a company, an organization, and operating as a member of a team. We have to use teamwork to accomplish certain things. I know you understand this. I'm sure I'm just preaching to the choir, but it needs to be said since we're talking about teamwork. Combat leadership, something near and dear to my heart. Um, shields to the left is the principle that I've kind of coined uh, for my own business, but the shields to the left principle, I'm gonna tell you a story and, and give you some practical application for how to implement this. And then conflict within teams. And then after this, we'll wrap up with how to motivate employees. So combat leadership, let's talk about the shields to the left. Many of you have seen or at least heard of the movie 300 that came out years ago it popularized and brought to kind of modern culture a true historical event where 300 spartans held off the a million man persian army now actual history recounts more like 3000 spartans versus about 800,000 uh, enemy but we can agree they were wildly outnumbered let me talk to you about the spartans for just a minute this picture of a young boy he's 7 years old at seven years old, 
you were thrown into the agogi, which is basically boot camp on steroids. And you were given a real sword, a real shield, a real spear, and you were taught to operate as a member of a team. Now I have five kids, four of them are boys. I don't like to give them even sharpened sticks, but they were given real swords and shields. And it, it drove home the importance of what it is they were training to do and training to be. They were assigned a philosopher, a mentor, uh, who would teach them and basically be a surrogate father. And they would raise them up in what is called the paideia, or the culture uh, that we're raised in, like a, a familial culture, paideia. They were taught art. In fact, by the time they were 16, these Spartan warriors had to be able to play a musical instrument in order to be an effective member of society. We wanted to make sure we weren't just creating barbarian warriors, but people who could actually be cultured, who could operate as a member of society, who could submit to governing authorities and so forth. Uh, Socrates is what one of my Marines called this gentleman, Socrates. They were taught philosophy. They were taught theologies and religions of other nations. They were taught economics and politics, of course, within the scope of their own nation, but of other adjacent nations as well. So as you can see, the organization, if you will, their leaders poured themselves into each individual. The strength of the pack is the wolf. They poured themselves into each individual. However, the strength of the wolf is the pack. The reason the Spartans were so successful in combat was not just because we took care of them on an individual level and made them the best warriors we could. It's because they fought in a military formation called the phalanx. Now the phalanx is where they would stand shoulder to shoulder with their peers, thrust out their spears and create something called a spear hedge and but create a shield wall. Now I'm actually not talking about combat right now. Listen to me for a moment. That shield that you see on your screen was not for the protection of the man carrying it. That shield was for the protection of the man to your left. This is actually where we get the term right hand man. This is also why in modern marriage, and I know times have changed and so forth, but traditional modern marriage, the daughter stands on the left and the father on the right as they walk down the aisle. It symbolizes that as I stand to her right hand, I have loved her since before she was even born. I have protected her. I have poured myself sacrificially into this young woman. I have disciplined and trained her from a young age. And now that's your responsibility. That's where this concept comes from. It's why we still, in the military, the senior officer stands on the right, the junior officer to his left and a half a pace behind his or her left. It's, it's a continuation of this. The pouring out of, of oneself for the benefit of the whole. We understand that the phalanx is so much stronger than one warrior, no matter how talented that one individual may be. Now, in addition to all of this, each of those rows was not haphazardly organized, but was organized by family members, neighbors, and friends. See, we understand on a human, again, a human emotional level, that if my son is fighting on my left and the neighbor kid from three doors down who I've known for nine years is fighting on my right, I'm, I'm less likely to turn tail and run, right? I'm more likely to give myself as strong as I can. And so the reason I bring this up is just to show you the strength of personal relationships in a team. It's so overlooked in today's work environment, but it is fundamental to the success of any team. When I was in the military, I knew everything about the guys I served with, everything, stuff that I shouldn't know. And it made us a stronger team, not just the training that we underwent, but just hanging out on a Friday night with these guys when we're all in our early 20s or even late teens. Obviously, we can't necessarily do that in our current work environments. There are even legalities against that. But as much as we can, let's build relationships with the people who we serve with. Now, we're working with other human beings. Conflict is an inevitable result of working with other human beings, even those who you radically love. Uh, again, I have five kids. There's conflict every day between them, between me, all of us, right? Healthy conflict, it's good. Uh, within the US, employees miss about three hours a week due to conflict. Uh, that's cost you a lot of money, costs the economy a lot of money, et cetera, great. About one out of four employees, avoid conflict altogether. They call in sick or they just don't go to that meeting or they you know, schedule another meeting at that time, which again equals missed days of work. 
So we're conflict averse or we have the wrong kind of conflict. And the reason I say the wrong kind is because as you can see here, conflict is necessary. According to a study just a few years ago, if you want to change something about a person, a process, the organization, the way we do things for the customer, it doesn't matter. If you wanna make any kind of a change, especially behavioral, then conflict is going to be inevitable. And not only inevitable, but it is actually necessary to have. So we have to understand the importance of conflict and having healthy conflict. I know I'm moving us quickly. You're welcome to ask questions at the end, of course. Um, but I wanna give you as many resources as I can and, and as many thought-provoking concepts as I can, knowing that we can always engage at a later date and plumb the depths of any one of these topics. The TKI, Thomas Kilman Instrument. Take the TKI.com, that's a website. It's free, I encourage you to take it. It's, it's pretty simple, unless you spend the 40 bucks, whatever, and get the robust deluxe version. But it's just a tool that we use to determine how a, an individual will react in conflict. This is not a personality test. Who I'm having the conflict with will change my results here. Right? If I'm having a conflict versus, with my wife versus a conflict with my best buddy of 25 years versus a conflict with my two-year-old son, the way I interact will be different because the way they interact and who they are is different. So as you can see right here, most people say compromise is the goal. Um, it's not, it's not, it's not. It is not. <laughs> Hopefully that's sunk in. Collaboration is the goal. It's a simple diagram. I won't over explain it, but essentially on the left vertical axis, how unassertive or passive I am versus assertive. Assertive does not mean be a jerk. It means I know what I'm doing, I have a plan, let's execute it. And I can be gracious, I can be, I'll use the L word, loving. But it means I know what I'm doing, I have a plan as a leader, let's execute this, let's do this. And I can convey that, communicate that clearly. And then the bottom axis, how uncooperative or unparticipatory I am versus cooperative. How much of myself am I willing to pour out for this team? And so you can do the math here or, or you know, draw the lines. If I'm unassertive and uncooperative, I'm avoid, uh, avoiding um, conflict. If I'm somewhere in the middle of both of those, I'm compromising. Ideally, we want to be very assertive and very cooperative. I'm sure you want me to talk more about that, but I'm not. Okay, how do we motivate employees? I want to wrap us up with this. Three things, three things. There are a million ways you can do this. There are a million <laughs> advisors and coaches who will give you a million different ways. So here are three things that I found to be highly successful. Again, bear in mind that uh, I'm, not, I, I'm not God, I'm not a prophet, I'm not the cream of the crop who's, who's been doing this for 50 years and has written 45 books on the topic. But I am somebody who's, who has personally trained and led tens of thousands of leaders and teams with great success. These are what I have found me to be the most successful shape the battlefield, cultus by design, and philotimo, another Greek word, philotimo of leadership. So let's jump into each one of these pretty quickly here. Shaping the battlefield is essentially planning and execution. If you want to motivate your people, they have to have something to be motivated by, and they have to understand there's a competency here. We can actually do it. We can accomplish it. Flexibility versus adaptability. This is a concept I love to teach. This is one of those things that I can turn into an hour long class, but I'm gonna take three minutes to go over with you. Again, just a thought provoker. Do you train your people to be flexible or adaptable? Because they are not the same thing. Let's assume this starting point down here on the screen is where I'm at right now. That second point up above is where I wanna go. Call it my objective. Well, to get from A to B, I draw a straight line. It's the fastest way to get there typically. Let's call that our plan. Now we start executing our plan. Here's some time right? Days, weeks, whatever. I'm executing my plan, but all of a sudden something changes. The objective has shifted, right? The customer needs us at a different date. One of my key players is injured or sick. Coronavirus, COVID-19 happens, okay? Uh, protesters take over a huge American city. Something has happened and a change is necessary. Well, if I'm flexible, I'm going to try and bend this, you know, think of the plan as a metal rod. It's bendable, but it's a metal rod, not a rope. I'm gonna try and bend that metal rod. What happens? I'm gonna fall short. Now, if the objective has only shifted a little bit, that's okay. We can work just a little extra overtime or try a little harder and we'll get there. But when the objective moves radically, 
I now have to, sorry about that, I now have to pivot. And so I have to draw a new red line all the way to the corner of the screen, right? That is adaptability, a new plan, a new plan. Perhaps the same skill sets, but a new plan. Do we teach our people to be flexible or adaptable? Flexibility is only, it is good, but it is only good for very minor changes and not many of them. Adaptability is far more important. If you want to be able to motivate your people, A, try to mitigate how many changes you're pushing down their throats. I say that with as much grace as I can muster, but as much candor as I have. Try to minimize how many changes, especially at once, you push down your people's throats. But when we do have to make changes, let's teach them how to be adaptable. When we shape the battlefield, default aggressive. I'm using military terminology, but you could easily swap the word initiative in here. A decision, even a bad decision, is better than no decision. I'm sure that's a contentious point for some of you. Based on my experience, we've all had people who've made bad decisions and we seem to be in an even worse spot, of course. But when you look at the long-term effects of not making a decision, of putting off a conversation, avoiding a conflict, failing to change a process that needed to be changed for three years, it kills morale. It kills the heart of the team. And it doesn't matter how well you train them or how many processes you give them. If the morale's not there, because that's what we're talking about, motivation of employees. If the morale's not there, it's not there. So any decision is better than no decision, even a bad decision. We can talk about it. I'm sure you'll have questions on that. And always remember, I had a captain who used to say, a plan is just something to deviate from. We have to do our due diligence. We have to be professionals. We have to plan. But in order to execute, we have to understand life happens. COVID-19 happens. Key personnel leave, retire, quit, get into car accidents. Life happens. So we have to teach our people how to prepare for that and be prepared to execute. Now, really quickly, continuing that line of thought, this right here is a standard defensive position in combat. Those great big barriers are HESCO. They're filled with sand. Uh, you have machine guns on top, sandbags. Off to the right, you see a plywood area that they can relieve themselves. There's a medical station, a connex box, storage. For all intents and purposes, in the middle of a combat zone, this is fairly safe, as safe as you can use that word. And yet, the guys and gals who sit here are anxious, they're frustrated, they're worried, they get bored and start fighting with each other. Why? Because they're on the defense. They're on the defense. This right here is the same group of guys and gals going out on a combat patrol. They are utterly exposed. A bullet can come from literally not just 360, but it's four dimension. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And yet, when you're on a patrol in combat, you're in a good mood. In fact, you could even use the term humorous. We joke around, even though what we're doing is deadly serious, literally deadly serious. But we joke around and we're in good spirits. Morale is high. Why? Because we're the ones executing. We're the ones taking the initiative. We're doing something. We're the ones with the plan and the enemy's supposed to be reacting to us. The other way was the exact opposite. So any plan is better than no plan, but obviously as a professional and as a leader, we want to craft rock solid plans to the best of our abilities. Second way to motivate employees, culture. Culture comes from a Latin word cultus. It is the root word that also leads to the bad word of cult um, that we don't like to hear. But that's where the word comes from, cultus. And cultivating really has two primary definitions. There are about six total, but two primary whenever we use the word cultus. It means to cultivate or grow out of. You could even use the term nurture, nurture. And it also means to worship. That is what cultus means. When we talk about a culture, we're talking about a people group that worship something. And please don't be off put by like religious speak. That's not what this is. But when I say worship, what is it that we are striving towards? What does your organization worship or value? So we might use words like integrity. You might point to a great big board or a web page that has our vision, mission, and values. Well, that's all well and good, and I strongly encourage that. But what do you really do? Right? We can't say that we're in, we're a culture of integrity when. People are constantly getting reprimanded for using the company credit card when they're not supposed to. And when, you know, we tell the customer we'll call them at a certain time, but we don't. What are we actually worshiping, so to speak? 
What are we actually walking the walk on? That's our current culture. So we have to grow the right culture and that, that happens by default or by design. If we aren't intentional with the culture that we're propagating, we may get a bad one on accident because we're always going to have a culture no matter what. Within the Marine Corps, our uh, values are honor, courage, and commitment. Those are our core values, honor, courage, commitment. Every single thing we do in combat and training with our families has to be in support of those three things. And when we fail to live up to those, we are disciplined and held to those high standards. Finally, philotimo, another Greek word. Philotimo is hard to translate into the English language, but it essentially means a love of honor. A love of honor. You could even say a goodness or a righteousness, a desire to do what is noble, pure, right. A love of honor is the closest translation I can give you. It's easy for a leader to take care of our own when times are good or, or maybe when they're hard, but it's somebody who I care about, it's easy to take care of my troops. It's easy for a supervisor to you know, make a change in pay very quickly or to send an email or a letter of recommendation to somebody who's always been kind to them. But what happens when it's an enemy who was shooting at you five minutes ago, the battle's now over. Would you run out there and save him like this guy? This, this was a bad guy, he's saving him. Is this something that we do for our people at work? You know, that person with the bad attitude who always seems to be in the way or always seems to be obstinate just for the sake of being obstinate. Do we treat them with the same firmness, fairness, and dignity that we give to everybody else in the organization? Because one of the fastest ways to decrease morale, to demotivate your people, is to show partiality. Now, I'm not talking about rewards and recognition for perf top performers, but penalizing somebody who I've had run-ins in the past for a current behavior is unjust. That is unjust, it's not justice. And it's not, it's not by any stance a good way to grow trust or morale of a team. We're just about done here. I'm gonna close this out with a saying from Bruce Lee. I would rather be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. And you can put a lot of meanings to this, but essentially what he was saying is, it is better to be overtrained than it is to be underprepared. Look at your leaders, since that's what makes the biggest difference to the success of a team. Look at who is in your leadership positions in your organization, from the executive level, all the way down through that frontline supervisor. Look for the natural leaders, leaders who don't have any title. What beliefs are they espousing? What behaviors are they encouraging? Are they the right ones? What training do they need? Ladies and gentlemen, sometimes it just one hour of communication training completely changes behavior for the rest of that leader's life. It, it, it's, it's unlikely, but it can happen. After a day of training, it's guaranteed to happen. <laughs> I can't say guaranteed because we are individuals who make our own choices, but I'm sure you understand where I'm coming from. Okay, let's close this out here. Uh, debrief. We talked about some statistics. I threw a match pretty quickly on, on teamwork. Anagnorisis and peripatia are aha moments and our turning point, the way we view or shift our perspective on a story, on a person, on ourselves. I gave you a really quick team building exercise for how to start collaboration and maybe start some conflicts which might need to be negotiated with some help. We talked about leadership, how that undergirds everything, the importance of conflict. And finally, I close this out very quickly with motivation. Again, planning and execution, build a culture and the philotimo of leadership. I like this proverb, if you wanna go fast, go alone. It's true, you wanna go fast, go alone. But if you wanna go far, go together. Ladies and gentlemen, that is my time. And Heather, I am available for questions as long as we have them. Yeah, definitely. So before we get into the questions, we do have a couple. I do wanna to touch on um, the Leadership Solutions program that I mentioned at the beginning. So Blomquist Hell is partnering with Joshua at Perspective Approach to bring you guys a Leadership, leadership Solution program. Um, it is a separate program, so there is an additional fee. However, there's a couple different options. So the first one is the Targeted Leadership Approach. So this is more of a coaching program. So um, if you're, the leader here that can implement this or if you want to do it for your team whatever you feel like doing you can forward information on but um joshua can do it for one person at an organization or multiple at an organization um, but each 
session is separate. So it's one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, and then the other option is the leadership group training. So that would be more of a group um, setting and it's a multi-week thing, I believe. And so is the coaching. So um, just wanted to let you guys know those options. And when I send out this recording, I will send kind of like a flyer that talks about those things. And like I said, if it's you that wants to do it, you can take it to your leadership, um, you can do that. Or if you're thinking about doing it for yourself or your employees, you can do that as well. Um, Josh, do, Joshua, do you have anything to add on that? Um, no, it's highly flexible. It's highly customizable. So those are the baselines, you know, the starting points, foundations that Heather just gave to you. If you want me to train you on just about anything, I can do it. Uh, teamwork, leadership related, which encompasses a lot. Um, but yes, yeah, we're here to serve. Awesome. Yep. So if you're interested in that, you can just respond to my email and we can um, start talking and get you guys connected. Um, so yeah, just want to let you know that that is an option. So let me get to the question. So one of the questions um, was, so you had mentioned treating people different if they're, you know, just kind of the troublemakers or whatnot. Do you think that affects the entire team, not just that one person because other people see it? So does that make sense? Yes, so one of the things, practices are wonderful, they're, they're important. I think that they should always be supported by a principle. The flip side of that is true. A principle without a practice is essentially worthless. It's just an idea floating in our heads. So putting these two things together, uh, the practice of treating people fairly, what's the principle here? If you look at somebody who gossips, let's say you have a friend and your best friends, you really get along, but this person is a gossip. It's going to affect how much I'm going to trust that person, even though I really care for them. The same, the same is true of leadership. I could have <laughs> a turd, somebody who's just always obstinate and frustrating and not a high performer. In fact, kind of the opposite at times, maybe. And if I reward them differently or punish them or discipline them differently than I would the top performer, that's an injustice and everyone sees it. Everyone sees it. So they recognize you're no longer steadfast. Yes, you're a human, you make mistakes, but they're gonna say you're no longer a steadfast bastion of justice, right? Justice is supposed to be blind for a reason. You now are showing favoritism and the terrible P word enters into the, the realm, politics. You've just introduced politics by failing to hold fast your commitment of blind justice. Cool. Okay, and then one of the questions was, um, they said, I missed the test website that you spoke about a couple slides ago. Can you repeat it at the end? So. Oh, um, I think what you're referring to is take the TKI.com. I believe that's what you're talking about. That's it. So. Um, thank you everybody for being here. And like I said, I'll send the recording hopefully out tomorrow um, and along with a flyer about the services that Joshua is going to offer. It's, it's pretty awesome. So I'd recommend at least looking into it. And then um, if you have any questions, just reach out to me and we'll get, get them answered. So thanks everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks Heather.